Hello, this is Lewis Michael. And this is Gabrielle Christensen, your co-host. And welcome to the podcast. away from the time of this recording but when this recording comes out Shahime will have already arrived in Yasha um spinoff or what on the sequel yep second season is in Yasha second season sequel yeah sequel hmm. been listening to a youtuber called Axel Beats break down all the Inyasha stuff I am ready hmm. jump back in and it was a dog right yes it wasn't that we sit down on a, a podcast or something that it was a cat because I was a cat because yeah. it was ears yeah Lucky. yeah Cause Cause got I, more I complain a... about how it didn't really look like a dog. It was more like a cat. I kept jumping up in trees and stuff. I never <laughs> once have seen a dog up in a tree. So. That's just because you're not around the uh, Japanese dogs. He just saved people. Yeah. That one famous dog that in Japan that, yeah, that saved someone. I, I don't remember <laughs> the name of it. So many animes and stuff all about it. Vaguely, although right now, anytime I think of a cute dog from Japan, all I think about is the 90 anime that I can't remember the name of right now. But they had a cute dog in it, and the chick was super hyper, and she was in love with the main villain of the series, and she was actually a villain as well. And there's a cute dog, and she, you know, at first she sees him, she's like, Oh, look at this cute puppy, I'm gonna take him home and eat him. Yeah, like the bad guy had another hot chick that he really liked and it made the other chick really jealous. Yeah. Um, and she was constantly getting sick and coughing up blood and stuff. That was her yeah, whole no. arc. Emperor El Palazzo was his name. I can see here he her. Was, um, the bad guy, he was like, he looked like Pegasus from Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. With white hair and stuff. and Excel Saga. Yes, Excel. Yeah, I remember that one. Because <laughs> it was such a trope. You, you see his cute puppy. The puppy's thinking so first to see from his perspective as it looks all cute and sad. And she's like, oh, look at you little thing. You'll be great for emergency rations. Carry around the dog everywhere. Just in case. I'm like, yeah, that's... Yeah, I haven't watched that in forever. I... So that I could didn't... be your dark spin on Inuyasha as Kagome is really hanging around Inuyasha just like, I'm stuck in the feudal world. If for some reason, I can't get back. It'll be great emergency rations. Mm. I did notice that um, Demon Slayer was on Hulu, but not dub. So, yeah. Hopefully it'll be dubbed soon. They haven't uh, made any mention of when the uh, movie will be coming to America. It's supposed to release in Japan on October 13th. But they haven't announced when the American theaters will receive it. Yeah, with this pandemic, it's just kind of hard to see um, films. Which I had to do a warning false, though, before we get into this. If you have kids or don't want to hear... Um, bad words or cussing or well stop the podcast now this is your final warning stop now okay so fuck film critics <laughs> <laughs> we um went and watched on um, tenant not too long ago and yeah fuck film critics not in the and, fun way either no like, this, they all should die i'm gonna say something that, you know, about them in the pandemic and it's not gonna be good I mean, yeah. unless you're a YouTube film critic, you're fine. You're fine. It's just your Hollywood ones that... Yeah, the, the bullshit professional, you know. The ones, like, the professional ones, not just the YouTube ones, but... I'm sure there's YouTube ones out there like that, but... but yeah, like, like, first of all, the film is good, but, like, there was a lot of problems with it. But, like, all the film critics, all problems was problems that wasn't even there. They came up with problems to not like the film. Like, they didn't even talk about the actual problems with the film. You know, like, one, it was so stupid. They, oh, the reason why the bad guy did not like the good guy was because he was black. Uh, no, the reason why the black, the bad guy hated the good guy was because he was the good guy. <laughs> you know, the, he's the bad guy. He's the good guy. They supposed to hate each other. That's whole porn. Shouldn't you make I mean, your villain as unlikable as you possibly can? So if you have a short, privileged, white jack-off, shouldn't you make him racist too? 
for no reason other than yeah but i don't think he was racist i think he just uh, he just like, he just like thought one, the guy was trying to sleep with his wife at first yeah and they like, made and him he, think that he um they found out he was part of the cia and I'm like well okay right there and there you know because the bad guy was russian so they gonna hate any american you know one way or another and see a guy trying to sleep with his wife you gonna hate him he wasn't actually sleeping with his wife but i mean i think the wife kind of wanted him to sleep with her yeah i think she didn't, didn't mind but i think there was like just um it was just part of the plan to make him think that they were sleeping spoiler warning as well i didn't like the ending was fine i didn't like what they did with the wife's character at the very end it still bugs me i guess that not at the very end but in the climax of the movie it really pissed me off again spoiler warning they had the plot she was not to kill anyone until they explicitly said it's fine to kill him and she just got mad pretty much unprovoked she was as provoked as she was going to be suggested for him to lay down so she could put suntan lotion on him he does so nicely and then she just gets pissed off and it's like i can't take this anymore i'm gonna kill you i'm like dude they didn't fire the flare yet just wait just, just wait a minute fantasize about it maybe while you're putting suntan lotion on him but he wasn't that could have been done better they could have had it to where he was about to kill himself do something like that so she felt like she would have to kill him right in that moment he was going to later but at that moment he was just going to lay there and let her put suntan lotion on his back he was fine he didn't know where this was going she flipped the lid she was lucky because everything worked out but it just kind of ruined her character for me i understand it was like there's a time gap between the going forward and going back so like there was like a gap there that it would not have mad on that she did that or not yeah, but she wasn't aware of that because to her the whole plan was explained as no matter what you do you can't kill him until we fire the flare gun because that's when the bomb is disarmed and until that point if he dies no matter what time you're in then the bomb will go off we have to make sure that bomb isn't set to detonate anymore when you kill him she didn't wait Luckily, it happened right after they disarmed the bomb, so nothing happened, but she could have ruined the whole movie. Yeah. And like I said, it would have been different if, like, he had seen, because I know her past self, it'd be different, because I know that he's seen that her past self was on the way back to the boat with her child. So he could have got the clue then that this wasn't the past wife who didn't know about his crazy time traveling ways and decide to kill himself then or kill the kid or kill her but he wasn't aware that they were back yet she just jumped the gun They're, they could have easily wrote it to where she had no choice but to do that the whole line was i'm not gonna get you the pleasure of taking us down just because you feel like it i won't let you have the last say in this okay if you feel like you're in immediate danger but instead she just got real impulsive and killed him without there being a real reason to at that point mm -hmm. he was an abusive asshole all that time but she sat there and had a conversation with him and let all that tension build and then still tried to kill him prematurely but you know the one thing about that though about all the reviews i read and listened to they did not mention that one bit at one time it's because they're all dudes reviewing it and i'm a chick and i'm like no don't destroy your mm. cool female character who's actually a believable loving mom in a shitty mm. situation and make her an asshole don't do that yeah, just, but they did this film critics are just um the useless really you know the, like look at the last jedi they gave that on rotten tomato like a 93 actually at fall so it was 97 and they put it down because that one complained about it and so now it's like at 93 and it's like oh not that good and then like they give like really good ones you know movies like a bad grade and it's like uh and then like the people themselves are giving it really good you know like that ghost of shima game, video game yeah. critics hated it but yet people loved it last last of us part two critics love it people hated it you know and it's like i think critics in general well not as film critics or video game critics i think they just out of touch with the reality anymore of the media the actual media it's more about like like if you follow a certain film critic or some you can tell like what they gonna say about this movie or that movie just based on because they just putting out their own opinion and to me like why is your opinion more important than my opinion 
Well, it's even worse than that. It's not really even their own opinion on the arcs. They're supposed to be theatrically trained and all that lovely stuff. Uh, they just fell right on who couldn't make it into the industry. So they, they, oh, you know what? I'm going to criticize other people who hasn't got it into the industry. They are, but they're, they're also all... people who go off whatever seems to be the hot take when the movie's released. Like how people feel about it yeah, well, or what the hot pressure topic points are. Like how a lot of these like, celebrities all hate um, Donald Trump. They just hate him because they're all like, oh, I want to be like the cool kids who hates him, you know? Like, yeah. It's like, okay, whatever. I mean, I don't really like Donald Trump either, but, you know, it's like, I'm going to hate him just because, you know, people, most people in my age group hates him too. I mean, I, or, or most people like me hates him too. I'm like, no, this is my opinion. This is your opinion. I'm not going to follow, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you can tell. Mm -hmm. So a lot of YouTube critics don't have the same. They might even do the hot take to get clicks and views, but mm -hmm. they still have their own opinion and they can also still be fair about the art and have good points and be like, oh, well, the editing was off or I really like the editing. I thought the story part fell flat. They can review it fairly. Chris Stuckman's one of those I watch on YouTube. He reviews stuff pretty fairly. He oftenly disagrees with the by and large hot takes from film critics he's like i th think they missed the point mm -hmm. is that they go to the movies and they don't even really want to enjoy movies anymore that's not a thing like tenant they complain about how it came out during the pandemic and that's why it's a bad movie and like that's had nothing to do with it being you know well not it's a good or bad movie because it was released in during the pandemic or whatever that's nothing to do with the quality of the film they worthless and most of them are just journalists and we both work in that industry i don't anymore but you still do and you have to deal with journalists every day and those type of people and you know as well as i do they are idiots yeah and they just appeal to the uh squeaky wheel and they're worried about backlash from the loudest people so if they don't say oh i thought this was sexist oh i don't like this movie because it's crap Oh no, Disney has their name on it, and most people like Disney? Oh, it's gotta be a wonderful movie then. There's nothing ever could be wrong with a Disney film. Well, I had problems with Tenet was, um, not one of the film at, um, critics ever really talked about it. You know, it was, um, the editing. It just felt very uneven and, like, not focused. And, like, like I know a lot of film um, critics, they was talking about how it was really hard to understand what was going on or to follow story um especially in like the later half of the film and um they talk about how they thought that was had to do with like just bad writing i don't think it was actually bad writing i think it was bad editing it did not give you time to really focus you know on these characters or um time to really focus on dialogue or anything the editing was a lot like what i thought about um the rise of skywalker they did the light s speed skipping editing because they did the light speed um skipping in the film jump from here to there to here to there and like kept going back and forth and stuff and force awaken it was kind of like that um like at the beginning with um ray when we false in introduced to ray and she's like driving through the the desert and climbing you know inside that um death star or whatever it was i really liked those scenes but like some of those shots just didn't feel like it was focused enough on ray and like and then we get to a different scene or a different shot um shot is like one of the greatest shots in cinema you know, and movie history is in on um, a new hope luke skywalker goes out you know, he's, he, he gets done drinking his blue milk. He goes out and he looks out into the horizon to the two suns and stuff. And yeah. that scene was only like two shots, like two camera angles, and that was it. And like the one like kind of close up and kind of looking down and kind of looks up and to the and to the two suns and then they pull out to a different shot to a wide angle shot and with just those two shots and how it was framed and how you know mark hamill's performance like you can tell that what was going through his head what was he was thinking and his uncle just told him that he can't you know leave and 
but he wants to leave and you know he, he just don't doesn't know what to do with his life and just thinking what um as yoda said looking out into the horizon to me we just never got that in tenant or the rise of Skywalker, like, can never focus on the emotions and characters in the movies. It's um, kind of lost to history, actually, that kind of filmmaking. I can't remember the last movie I watched where it had a nice moment where they showed what was going on and let you draw your own conclusions mm-hmm. versus exposition where they tell you, hey, by the way, I'm thinking about this, and I might do this, and then someone shoots me almost in the face. They don't... Yeah, I... I um, yeah, I think it's a lot of it, like, now we get into a point where, um, the Alfred Hitchcock family said this about Steven Spielberg. Said something like how Steven Spielberg is the foster act on to them with, in, with no imagination or something like that, or no creativity or no art to <laughs> it. And I think that now, like, yeah, there was still art. He was still you know, creative. Now that we get in other generation of Greg Dons and, and that's... heard it said too, it's about cost savings as well. A lot of times they'll try to get, you know, quickest cuts or the most mm-hmm. camera views and not yeah. really focus on a nice long tracking. What was I? I was just watching something where they were breaking down Carrie, the original Carrie film. But they had this nice long tracking shot where they were tallying up the votes. And they actually did that all in one take. They didn't have the equipment now. Um, available to us now then where everything was you know movable on its own apparatus it had to be a guy following this girl around the whole room and when the executives came in and were looking at how much that would cost to produce they threw a fit and the film director had to step up or the director of photography filmography had to step up and say no I absolutely want this to be in the movie it has to be in the movie it stood his ground to make sure it did get in the movie we don't get a lot of that these days I think people just kind of oh, okay well we'll do what's cheaper I think that's why Hollywood is going to go more independent to where you're not so restricted by, you know, dumbass <laughs> um, executives and stuff, you know, who don't you know, have no idea, you know, like film critics, they don't know anything about the actual film process or anything. So, and it's like, oh, me, 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 me. If they did, they wouldn't be complaining about the color of the skin of the fucking hero. And whether or not a bad guy liked him or not. <laughs> like, another thing, the tenant, they, um, complain about how they like Chris Van Nolan was racist because he didn't use the hero was um John David David um Washington he didn't use him to his fullest potential but yet I've seen interviews with him and he's talking about how Chris Van Nolan like really challenged him on this film and stuff and you know I was like do you guys even listen to to yourself when you talk yeah and I, I thought um he did a good performance and I he did good, and I don't understand why they thought he didn't. I mean, he practically got to be the last man standing and everything. There wasn't really a point where he, you know, was the absolute loser or anything. He was the main hero all the way through. Yeah. And yeah. all the emotional beats. Got to save the woman that he was very attached to at the end, you know? It just... Mm-hmm. Like I said, I, I think a lot of the problem was is the, the editing, and um, I don't know if they was rushed in it or what but it just seemed I just didn't like it I think I said this to you and I was joking like like yeah that's probably because she was a woman and then like the Rise of Skywalker was edited by a woman too that can't be really fair to say that because well actually it was a woman who directed Star Wars the original and New Hope in which I just explained how I thought that had great cinematography great editing in it but then again the editor for that was um long time um editor veteran she she did a lot of like big name also i think like one of the problems like it seems to me with christopher nolan's it seems like like each movie since inception he he used to just like work with a certain crew and been working it ever since like mento was filmed back in like 2000 i think it, it came out and so the same crew and stuff, you know, same different actors, but there's a few same actors, you know, and but mostly the crew itself have been same until after 
Inception. And I think Inception was his most popping, greatest film, aside from The Dark Knight, of course. Dark Knight Rises, he had a different cinematography. Like, cinematography was good. I just think this wasn't as good as what Dark Knight was or Inception was. And his next film, he lost another Paulson. In his next film, he lost another Paulson. Maybe you should get, you know, the whole Motley crew back in and do that. And maybe that what kept him grounded. And the original actor he used to was um, Lee um, Smith. It was another, like, a veteran um, film editor. And I, they use a different composer on Tenant as well. And, which, I thought the music was good. But it just still is, like, wasn't that Christopher Nolan, like, signature music. And it was in Hans Zimmer. His original composal didn't have what that feeling is what like the dark knight or inception was and plus like you know after the dark knight christopher nolan's pr- was pretty much given free reign of doing whatever the hell he wants so hollywood <laughs> continuously do it oh no it was a good movie no one fell asleep no after everyone's interest so mm-hmm. like i said other than like you're saying the editing kind of more towards the end of the film too because the beginning it's nice keep track of everything yeah, yeah. it's just the very end just kind of got well middle to end there's a particular scene in the middle after a car chase that it just seemed like the editing kind of went just haywire yeah. after that yeah a little bit but it was still enjoyable yeah i mean it's a movie that i would be interested in getting like a blu-ray of and listening to the commentary and stuff yeah i don't know if this one no one does commentaries so i think he's one of the few that i actually would buy that doesn't have commentaries i don't remember what any of the other films had commentaries on, on it i have really good special features but i don't think commentaries i don't buy any movie that don't have commentaries on it i mean well stuff for like you know disney and stuff but like because they normally don't do it they just never did you know Pixar, they do it sometimes but disney not no they don't do it at all but um but yeah to me it just one of the best way for you know directors to give back to a inspiring you know young filmmaker on him talking you know about how he made this awesome film or whatever you know and to me i think that's just so easy you just sit there and talk about your movie you know how you made it and what what did you do how did you film this shot what you know how did you write it you know yeah it's more appreciation to the actors and everyone else involved too mm-hmm. get to hear back from them oh yes one day on set i remember i was there for like five hours or like the uh conversation they had with the um i guess that's what comic-con panels are good for though too because i'm thinking of the new mutants they were talking about for one of the scenes the uh, swimming pool scene that they were there all day and i guess because the guys wanted to look as ripped as possible they just weren't eating and drinking so their muscles when you get dehydrated pop out more mm-hmm. and the guy almost passed out because he was just like it was it was such a long day and the director was like like oh yeah yeah because you told us we couldn't eat anything he's like no <laughs> Go get something to eat and drink if you need to, guys. Come on. Those kind of interactions are nice. Well, I've been 35 minutes, so I think it would be a good time to go into um the topic. Where we actually get to review something properly. Yeah, unlike those damn fucking <laughs> film critics. <laughs> So, the topic for today is Black Clover Season 1. An anime I thoroughly enjoyed. An anime I... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never Given Up on Your Dreams is the premise of Black Clover Empowering Story. The series follows Asta and Yuna, two underdogs heroes on a heartfelt journey to becoming the Wizard King. Although flawed in the false season of the Black Clover, anime lays a solid groundwork of introducing us to the Clover Kingdom. This season proves to have potential of being a great anime. It's on the fantasy manga created by Yuki Tabata, two orphan boys named Asta and Yuno are the center of the plot of Black Clover. A world filled with magic, Yuno possesses enormous magical abilities. However, Asta doesn't appear to possess any magical abilities, which is very uncommon in the magical world of Clover Kingdom, and by may I say, they beat that over his head so many times throughout the first season. They're like, man, then this world full of magic. You don't have any magic? 
you must be the unluckiest person ever. I'm like, okay. The like, first time I heard it, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, that sucks. And then like by the fifth time, I'm like, shut up. No, so you guys are supposed to be his friends. Stop it. Anyway, although I'm sure we will see his hidden magical power later in the series. Immediately, we are shown a clear sense of the contrasting personalities between Asa and you know with a brief and effective flashback. Yuna is portrayed as a calm, sedated, and intelligent, while Asa is portrayed as an outgoing, overly obnoxious, and carefree. Even though Asa may seem dumb, he is shown through progress of the series that he can be quite intelligent. The constant yelling and obnoxiousness of Asta can be quite annoying and off-putting for viewers and especially for other characters of the anime show. Despite this personality trait, you will find yourself rooting and identifying with Asta because of his orphan background and underdog status as a person without any magical abilities in a world where magic is the norm. Asta's best trait is his inspiring devotion of never giving up, even when he didn't at first receive a grimoire or was picked by the captains. He will never ha give up on his dreams of becoming the Wizard King. Another great aspect of Asta's character is how he doesn't look at Yuna with any resentment or jealousy. Because of Yuna being naturally gifted with magical talent, in the flashback scenes, a young Yuna is attacked by a drunk man. Asta, at the last minute, saves, saves him from a drunken fiend. From this moment on, Yuna vows to study magic and become powerful and to pay back the debt he owes to Asta, saving his life. Yuna also has the ambition of becoming the Wizard King, causing the two heroes to have a friendly and supportive rivalry. The visuals of the Black Clover anime are what you would find in your typical action anime. Some of the backgrounds, special effects, and battle scenes are quite stunning. There are also some interesting camera work that give the viewer a cinematic action to the battle scenes. The character designs is where the anime series is lacking. There are some interesting designs. Unfortunately, many of the characters' designs are pretty generic. First time looking at the characters, especially Asta, the viewer can easily tell the characters' personalities before even watching the anime. The story of Black Clover is hardly the most original one, at least based solely off the anime. The series does take elements from other popular animes like Bleach, Fairy Tale, my Hero Academia, to name a few. Although, to be fair, those anime do also take elements from Dragon Ball Z and other anime. However, with this generic character designs and characters' backstories, the viewer may feel as though the anime is too predictable. As mentioned before, I've only seen the first season of the anime and haven't read any of the manga yet. Hopefully, the Black Clover anime will come into its own and definitely has promise of becoming a great anime. Yeah, I uh, really enjoyed going back to Asta and you know, the first time you see them being set up and you're like, oh, especially in my mind, I'm like, is this a Naruto and Sasuke thing? We're gonna have Asta who's super excited and hyper and then we're gonna have you know over here who's kind of like the dark broody one and he's just gonna hate Asta for no reason, you know, really, and just be a jerk the whole series. No, thankfully, it's not. They're actually both likable characters, and that's nice to see for a change. It kind of subverted my expectations. I agree with a lot of your points that a lot of it is kind of generic storytelling, but they add just enough of a little bit of a twist that I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting enough. It gets a laugh out of me. I will say also for Asta being annoying, it to me wasn't as annoying as Naruto the first season in the American dub where like Naruto was like, believe it. Like every other sentence is like, I'm going to do this. Believe it. Believe it. It got really annoying really fast. Asta, actually that's part of his character. Like you were saying that the other characters comment on how he's annoying and obnoxious and really loud. That is part of his character and they do address it and he kind of tones down a little bit. It seemed like to me at least through season one. And just so everyone knows, um, this, what we reading is a um, review that I wrote, so this is mainly just my opinion, not Abby's, just so we, for the record on that. Um, but, but yeah, I to me it just, like, like, Naruto, I actually never really got into Naruto because of that reason. I just thought it was, <laughs> he was loud and not toxic and like, I was texting you this when I was watching this, like, Asta reminds me 
a lot of Black Star from So Edom. Yeah. And like in So Edom, my favorite character was um at Death to the Kid. Like he was like you know kind of like more what you know was um kind of more like the calm. Like he will get like irritated and stuff and start yelling, but because of his the two guns people. Yeah, two, two, sis- two, two systems. Guns. The systems like would piss him off about something, and mostly the fact that they weren't symmetric. Yeah, it really pissed him off. I'm like, well, sorry, um, man. And so, like, I kind of identify more with the calm, collected, like Kirito from Sora Online. He was, like, you can see him going off and stuff, and he don't, he wasn't like loud and obnoxious or anything like that. It was more like his friend Clyde or something. He was kind of like that. But you know, I don't know. It's it, more of Paulson preference to, for me because I'm more like like that and, and I was gonna that. say I'm more of a fly person myself kind of see I'm not quite as uh, ambitious as Naruto would be or as even Black Star I forget what his because he, he was an annoying character man I couldn't and uh, Soul Eater Black Star just for some reason drove me up a wall his character like Asta doesn't really but Black Star every time he was on there I'm like dude just go away <laughs> I don't care. Stop yeah, talking. I mean, so Eden himself, he was a pretty cool guy. He really had that kind of laid back, you know, cool yeah. type of, you know, thing going on, you know. My favorite yeah. character in that ended up being the uh, big villain at the end that we got to see. Um, I forgot the name of him, but the one that they go down to the bottom of the school. Man, it's been forever since I watched Soul Eater, so I'm probably going to mm. get a lot of this wrong. But he was once a Reaper himself, and he actually ate partner and his whole thing is he projects fear but he's so afraid himself of everything i liked his character a lot he's kind of the a little bit obnoxious himself like that meme you attacked me with the other day it was just like some girl posted to her twitter or whatever yeah i like this character or what is it the guy was saying you know all your women are out there and you're like yeah I love this guy, and I'm over here like, you do realize that's a demon from the fifth dimension, and he literally wants to eat your soul. Shut up. Stop attacking me. That's <laughs> me in a nutshell. But like, my thing was, like, when mentioning the, the generic character design, like, before finishing season one, I kind of figured out who was who, and, and like, when it introduced you to all the, um, you know, the black bulls, um, men bones I was wrestling even to a point like I knew who was going to be voicing which you know which American um voice actor was going to be voicing which characters because they always use the same voice actors and they always and they all had like, pretty much that same you know in every other anime that same generic backstory and, and character design I like, just felt like like there was some character designs like it was trying to be different I think they was kind of like trying to be like in Bleach. Because to me, like Bleach has some of the best character designs. And um, especially like when it came to like the um, Spada. Like, yeah. Gr- like Grim Jow. Like, oh, yeah. He was awesome. He like, was awesome. And, like a lot of the villains was. Um, what was the, the one main villain of the um, Spada? That he had a fight that was like, was like a demon. He turned into a demon. Oh, are we talking about the uh, Al? Oof, I should know him. The emo guy. Was, yeah. Like, got, had green eyes. and. Yeah, I should know him because I... It was, was like number two. Yeah, that was the fanfic favorite because Grim yeah. Jaw was always pissed at him. was like, I'm going to fight you. And the other guy's like, dude, I literally don't care. It, you cannot. not... not how you say it, though. That is not how you say it. I agree. <laughs> I don't remember it being said like that. So now his name's just not Grim Jaw. Huh? Not Grim Jaw. Not Grim Jaw Al guy. Yeah, number four guy. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the character okay. designs were unique. Yeah. I know in uh, Black Clover, Clover, there is the whole controversy in that season about which captain may or may not be working for the bad guys. And all I can think of when you get introduced to the captains, and it might be a red herring, is you see the leader of the uh, Golden Dawn. Mm-hmm. He looks just suspicious as hell. And he reminds yeah. me of the... Like, haven't watched berserk i tried to watch the remake of berserk or the continuation that was ugly as hell and i couldn't get into it but he reminds me of the main secondary character of berserk the one who ends up being the villain at the end that's what this guy kind of looks like with his mask hmm. but it might just yeah. be to be a red herring in the story yeah. because even the characters will comment on how suspicious he looks because yeah. of his mask they'll be like well why are you always wearing a mask that's weird yeah and the, like towards the end of the season one they they was when they was gathering 
in the captain's meeting. They, um, that one, head captain, Armada. Oh wait, that was, that's from Bleach. <laughs> See, I told you, it's all generic and from other animes. Um, but no, um, captains get in a meeting and they're all talking and the um, captain from the Golden Dawn, he shows up late and... And like so they was really suspicious of him but yeah I, I think it's gonna be a red herring too but i haven't like i said i haven't watched anything past season one so i don't know i haven't either which is probably good because otherwise i'd probably be trying to spill the beans right now and be like oh no man you have no idea it's like when our friend josh we were telling him we watched season one and he was just like oh did you meet that one witch girl and we're like what yeah. the sister's yeah. really cool and we're like what yeah. What are you talking about, Josh? He's like, oh, oh, sorry. Wait, wait. You said season one, right? Okay. Yeah, and, and, yeah. I just think the character design and the character's background and stuff, like, kind of like how they um, did that, where like, like each episode, like, I still would go on a um, like a mission with one of the other, you know, members, and then we kind of get the backstory with uh, like flashbacks. I like that, but it just seems like it was. A, backstories was kind of generic and you know it just to me it just felt but it reminded me what what it was like someone's false um comic book or false manga r- wrote um like it always gonna be almost a rip off of something else like one of the very false comic books or manga really if more was a manga that i wrote i wrote was like a straight up rip off of bleach like the guy was even looked like kind of ichigo and just had black hair and long black hair and he's all crescent black too and had a long ass sword just like him and a false kind of bad guy he made was just like um the guy with the glasses and the Quincy. Oh yeah. Um yeah, the guy who was the Quincy and Bleach. I think we just can't say Bleach names today other than mm, each go and Yeah. It was just like him. He was a guy that was kinda at false was like kinda bad guy but then became ally and a friend to the guy and, and he had like a character that was kinda like oh he and a he had the big guy that kind of was like like chad and it was just like bleach and he used like magic in it and stuff but, but, but yeah that's how i felt like um it's like this is a little bit too much like as animes and I, i've been kind of feeling like that's why i haven't been watching a lot of anime a lot because they just felt like just ripoffs of you know as animes and we even talked about that in the last podcast that uh, everything was a lot like sort of online yeah and stuff and like, yeah you, know. you get some real now like re-zero every once in a while there'll be interesting ones although those have been coming from light novels because well, re-zero s- sort of online was um light novel yeah so you have your yeah. original ideas that are coming yeah. from that but everything else is just kind of a retread although if they can make the series interesting enough because to me black clover has the characters have enough heart behind them it's not just like a I'm not sure how much that happens really in Japan, but it's not like a Hollywood cash grab. They're like, oh, here's this generic superhero. We're going to follow this formula and they're going to be just like everyone else. You can enjoy it. They seem like they have enough of a background to make them unique. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, like in the script, and it, there's potential in there, I think. I just think I would have liked it better if, um, you know, was the actual, he, he is the hero, but like, he, um, us is really the main hero, and I think it would have been that he was the hero. Like I said, that's more a personal preference of mine, because I'm more into heroes like that. And... You know, it might be because I keep getting, uh, follow a YouTube channel called Anime Balls Deep, and they got on the Black Clover train when it started, and at first I hated anime just without even giving it a chance, just the clips I saw and everything, I'm like, oh. This looks really stupid. It looks just like every other shonen anime out there. Mm-hmm. But they continuously have like thumbnails and stuff for the manga, and they're like, "What's the secret power? What does this mean?" It's a little spoilerish, but it's enough to make me like, "Oh," because they'll be like, "Is this gonna happen potentially with these characters?" And I'm like, "Maybe this is gonna go in an interesting area with the anime where it ends up throwing you a curveball your mm-hmm. second or third season." Yeah. And like I said, I, I think it. I, I continue to watch. I think it will be bad on. And, and so. Yeah, I'll be interested yeah. to see how it goes. Because right now, I, like you had said, you mentioned some of the anime that was like Naruto. It really reminds me of Fairy Tale. Mm-hmm. Like, especially the stylization of the characters really hit a, a heavy Fairy Tale 
motif with me. But honestly, after a while, Fairy Tale got boring. Like after the third season, it just, I wasn't interested in it anymore. So I'm hoping with this, it'll kind of do the opposite. Because so far, the story arc has only made me more intrigued by where they're going instead of like Fairy Tale, where it was just like, oh, here's your first season, climax, and kind of like Dragon Ball Z, you just got your big bads got too powerful and yeah. had your monster of the week type thing. Yeah. That's like one of the only things that was the problem with Bleach. That's like everyone was a little bit too powerful and too quick. So you had to make later on, they had to make the characters weak on to make the bad guys more powerful. So there would be a challenge. You know, like Renji, like Renji at first was like supposed to have been like just as powerful as any captain or something. Yeah. And then like he just like came pretty weak. Like all of a sudden everyone is powerful as a captain. I was like, wait, what? I thought Renji and um, Ikaku and um, his, his friend, Himachi Fuka. Yeah. Like, they were supposed like to be really powerful, too. And all of a sudden, they became, like, weak or something. The bad guy is too powerful. And so, and make every all the heroes weak. Yeah, that is the problem with plot. Instead of having a different way to raise the stakes, they're just like, oh, no, this character's really strong. And that's something I'm hoping... Black Clover doesn't do because it does seem like, like the thought eye they look like they might be a little bit too powerful at for the first season. Yeah, you know, especially since you end the first season the way you do with one, you're like, oh, well, how are you gonna see that point? How are you gonna switch that up and make it more frightening? Considering we're following your uh, new initiates. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely not as strong as captains. They even go through and they break down their ranking based off of their valor, pretty much. And the rewards they receive from the Wizard King. Which is all how you get to be a Wizard King, too, is your valor points. And how many good deeds your squad does. It makes you more likely to be presentable to the community and stuff. I think that makes it a little interesting. People would have to like you in order for you to become the Wizard King. But... But yeah, like in Bleach, the main villain in the fall season was Shook King or something. Yeah. Um, but you know, he was just a powerful hollow and that was it. But He also uh, had the uh, personal stake thing. Cause that yeah. was what killed Ichigo's mom. Mm -hmm. so he, there was that personal attack he could do on Ichigo as well. Yeah. Because wasn't it, because Rukia was weak at the time too. It was like he was a powerful hollow, but technically if she was at full strength, she could have taken him out on her own. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, kind of made her like kind of weak at the beginning. Yeah. And all of a sudden she was like apparently was just as powerful as any late lieutenant. It was just um you know Captain Kuchiki you know making making sure that she doesn't advance in the ranking in someone else's squad. <laughs> <laughs> like, he was always my favorite character in Bleach and Biakia. He, he was just like just an asshole but a badass and like really powerful. I'm over here yeah. and I'm like at somewhere between Rinji and Grim Jow. Mm -hmm. Rinji is cool. So many cool characters in Bleach. Kimpachi and his lieutenant. That was a weird dynamic. It was also cute, but he had this big bloodthirsty <laughs> and then he's got this little kid. Small child. <laughs> he was just like, oh, okay. Especially when they give this back story because honestly, he could give a shit. He just wants to kill people. Mm -hmm. so I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know how you have this child that you feel like you can protect. But you kill anyone else? I guess maybe she's stronger and I'm getting her credit for. She is a yeah. lieutenant. I think it says somewhere that, that yeah, she is powerful, but they, um, Kenpachi did it to make sure that um, eight hall lieutenants to trying to get his um his squad to become to work hard to become more powerful. Just you know, I, yeah, I thought it was funny that um like Paulson who trained Kenpachi or was like before him the um squad eight um. Yes, squad eight, right? Yeah, it's the medical. So it was yeah the the um the one captain that was like supposed to be like a lovely mom or something, this really sweet mom type person. He used to be the murder queen or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. Because yeah, I remember reading the I was role playing as Ichigo on a cruise for Paramore. Of course, it was. So. I was role playing as Ichigo, so I was trying to catch up on where the manga was, and I remember reading the chapter where Kimpachi finally got to kill her because they had had a battle back in the day, and if he was if he killed her, then he'd get a power up or something contrived, and he went to kill her, and it just wasn't the same because she wasn't as powerful, and he was crying about it. I think it was a weird chapter, but yeah, Black Clover, great anime, <laughs> somewhat great anime. <laughs> 
can say this, it held my attention better than Fate Grand Order, which might be because I played that Fate Grand Order Babylonia. I play that story on my phone, so watching it, even though it's beautifully designed, I just can't get into it, so. Yeah, and like, going back to the character design, you, you said that it was a lot like fairy tale. Yeah. I kind of thought, well, I guess it could be more the animation style. I mean, it's, it's anime, but it's, each anime show has its own unique style, but I think, I was thinking it was more like My Hero Academia. It's like, so many times, like, especially in, like, fight scenes, they have this, like, um, like, when they go to throw a punch or swing a sword, they have this really, like, where it stretches out, like, the face kind of stretched out, and they stretch out the image, the, the body really weird, like, I don't understand why they're doing it, because the whole, um, weight and volume thing of animation i think it just like it's overused too much and i and like i know my friend who i work with with the comic book he he does that too and i was like yeah just tone it down <laughs> <laughs> like tone it down a bit like mm. kind of like the difference between one punch man season one and season two you ever watch one punch man i remember the sakia and one punch man at first was like fantastic and then you watch season two and it was just kind of more of that generic battle scene mm. Also, like my hero academia, have both main characters not having this, the power. You know, like that, that was kind of where the generic you know, plot line came from. Like, well, there you go. I mean, that's kind of your. That's true. I didn't yeah. even really think about that. That Midoriya, Deku, and uh, Asta kind of had that same. Even their whole principle of it doesn't matter if I have it or not, I'm still going to be the best. I would say it's you know that makes the big difference there because in My Hero Academia, you only have Kachan, who's a dick, right? Straight dick the whole time, pretty much. Who also wants to be the number one hero. Mm -hmm. He just has to constantly belittle do Deku, and it's nice. They kind of had the same backstory, too, because Deku, Deku? Deku and Kachan, they started off as childhood friends, and then they end up, the Kachan's just real mean to him, and Deku's just like, oh, okay, you're still my best friend, though. Kind of attitude towards him. I'm actually kind of afraid of him, too. So it's nice to have Yuno and Asta, where Yuno's actually a decent human being. Mm -hmm. Is actually proud of his friend too, because he believes in him just as much as Asta believes in himself. And and many times in the in the season where he's like, "Don't underestimate Asta," you know, on the bad guys and stuff. Yeah. Well, definitely was. during the uh, entrance exam too, because everyone's sitting there and they're like, "Oh, that <laughs> the the Baha guy, the dude with the stupid hair, is blonde, and he's got it pulled back, kind of." Oh, yeah. In the yeah. headband, and he always has to say, but oh, I don't know. You watch the dub version, they might not have kept that. In the Japanese version, he ended like every sentence with, aha. It's just his thing. In fact, there was a little short in one of the uh, ends of the episodes where he was teaching people the secrets of Baha and how you're supposed to say Baha and really feel it. Anyway, that guy. During that fight, because they were all like, oh, this will be easy. And you know, just sitting there, and when it ends, he smiles as mm. his friend. Yeah. Wants him to succeed. Yeah. So is it safe to say we'll do a season two review on this or maybe, maybe not. Welcome to the news. Disney has unveiled a touching memorial to the weight Chadwick Boseman. The memorial was created by Nicholas Smith to honor Chadwick Boseman. He has named the memorial King Chad. The memorial depicts Boseman giving the Wakanda salute to a young man in a hospital gown wearing the Black Panther mask. Nicholas Smith said that he got the inspiration for the painting from Boseman's work with St. Jude's Hospital during his life. You can find this memorial located at the Disneyland Park. And even though the park session is closed right now because of the pandemic, there is parts of the area that are still open for shopping. Yeah, I remember like after he died, and there was like, I saw a whole bunch of pictures of kids and like, they had a little action figures and it was like showing the other superheroes like kind of like a Viking funeral or um, Black Panther. One thing I thought was really interesting is that all the little kids, you know, not all of them was black or was boys. They was all different genders, all different color and race and stuff. It just shows how, like, kids don't, don't look at it like that. They just, you know, look at it as, like, 
one of their favorite superheroes has passed. And I think that's how everyone should be. Their greatest you know. superhero and a great person. Mm -hmm. That's all they care about is as long as it's a good movie and a great person and they like the character, then they'll want to imitate him. They'll want to be them. Yeah. It kind of sucks that he's gone and, and like Black Panther on movies just ain't going to be the same. I mean, I, I have hope next Black Panther on movie, but it just... Without Chadwick, it's not going to be the same. It is sad that there's not really a, a good farewell to him. Plus, mm -hmm. they can make it into the next movie a way to do a touching, you know, farewell goodbye to the old Black Panther to reign in the new one. Yeah. They certainly will be missed and was a great person. Netflix has canceled The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. And another um, move by Netflix for canceling another show. Yeah, up Netflix. <laughs> and the critics. And why was it we had it? Kathleen Kennedy. Which we haven't even mentioned Star Wars. Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. Star Wars <laughs> always trickles in somehow. Okay. Had a discourse on good filming. Mm. Yeah, like, um, apparently, I can understand, kind of. Apparently, the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance was just really expensive to be made. Because these are all little puppets, and they didn't really use any CGI. I mean... They did use CGI, but not as much as what you would think and stuff. And a lot, a lot of it was, like, built, sets was built and stuff. And I wouldn't think it'd be much more than what, like, The Witcher is. And The Witcher is, like, we already getting eight seasons and getting spinoffs and stuff. And, like, I just don't see, like, okay, I'm showing it just about Agus expensive. And, yeah, The Witcher probably had more viewership but the age of resistance was i really loved it and i thought it was a great um prequel to original um 1982 was 82 um you know movie in the dark crystal kind of dragged in the middle a little bit in this story but oh that's the only thing i could really think of that i could talk badly about was that it was a little bit slow towards the middle of the series. It seems like sometimes Netflix just has a weird thought process they go through for canceling shows. They don't really mm. usually give a reason either. No. Yeah. As to why they cancel them. Um, hopefully, I don't know how Amazon is. Amazon Prime, as far as picking up shows or how supportive they are. But that might be a good place for the Dark Crystal to go. Well, um, because this is, was from the Jim Henson company Disney owns. Mm. So it probably, if it does get picked up, it'd probably be on Disney Plus, which would be pretty cool. So I'm like, oh, um, one more reason to cancel Netflix and just keep Disney Plus. You can just have uh, Amazon Prime on your side. Xbox has announced their release for the Xbox Series X and Xbox Series S. Uh, the pre-order started on September 22nd. The disk drive, the Xbox Series X, is set at $499, and the digital only, the Xbox Series S, will be $299. It's interesting because you compare that to the PS5, which will have its release date on November 12th, and the pricing for the PS5 is slated to be 500 for the disk drive PS5 version and 400 for the digital only copy. So Xbox will have quite the price difference, which I think that's really the first time in my memory I can see Xbox having that big of a price difference for similar products. Well, on the Xbox One, I think it was more than the PlayStation 4. I think it was like $100 more. They're trying to even the battlefield a little bit. And um, they, they do um take um, like a, um, what would you say, a marketed both companies marked the consoles down a bit because they would make back the profits and games and stuff. Right. One thing I want to say is that Microsoft, you, if you are listening this, to this podcast, which highly likely and not, I will do for free. Be your marketing um, awesome so I can help you name these fucking <laughs> things. And Series X and Series S. It sounds so much alike, and then you got the Xbox One X and the Xbox One S, and it is just. And Microsoft had always been really bad about marketing. Like the Microsoft Surface products is a good example. Like all the marketing stuff has nothing to do with artists or anything. And like not even like college students that who would be a great product for because they got this awesome pen just laying there and they're like oh yeah you know what you can do with this you can do some meaningless computer thing that you could always done in the past 80 years with computers <laughs> you <laughs> like, can add numbers yeah you can you can use this with a calculator got a calculator on it 
<laughs> well, hopefully their uh, marketing will improve now that Microsoft has bought ZeniMax, which is the parent company of Bethsaida. Um, of course, the deal won't be closed until the latter half of 2021 because they have to go through all the legal hoops to avoid becoming a uh, monopoly. Hmm. I was just reading a little bit about this. Apparently, this was like one of the reasons why they're going to be the later half of 2021 is because this was like a last minute thing. Like, I guess like Sony been talking to them about buying them out. And then like Microsoft just like, it was just a phone call and like, hey, about how I'm going to buy you. And then like, okay. And the very next, next day that when the news, news broke about how they bought them out. It was for uh, billions of dollars too, apparently. Yeah, 7.5 billion. Yeah. Right? It was pretty a lot. The thing is though, like, um, the exact same thing with like make song, the own little Twitch um thing, and then they just like completely shut it down. They do that actually a lot with their products. Again, they just don't market it at all. You know, one reason why Apple is so expensive because a lot of that goes into the research and marketing. Because they will research why people want to have a device like this and marketed that to the people i mean that's why apple is so good at marketing and they did say that like stuff like um f loop is being it's being created by um arcane studios they did on um, dishon on because that was a on a playstation exclusive and said that any games right now that was already being made for a playstation will still be for playstation i'm sure it would be like in a just a time exclusive and be brought to xbox i hope it's not just like it, it just becomes xbox exclusive that would be yeah. sad of course then again if microsoft is looking to make the most profit well microsoft here here lately they've been much more open about creating games for um playstation as well and it's like either way it's still profit yep. maybe not as much as it would be on the own platform on the xbox but still profit power to the games there's also promising news too that in that article uh, that they would be keeping the employees and staff up at SATA on so they weren't planning to do any major shake shakeups or change they did um say that there still isn't a release date scheduled for the elder scrolls 6 um but with this purchase, Microsoft is looking to improve the underlying gaming system of the title to kind of bring it more up to date for when it's actually released. Okay, let's. Okay, so um, Skyrim came out in 2012. It's what? 2020? Mm -hmm. 2020. Eight years. Minus. 2012. What was it? Eight years? Eight years. Eight years. So, what have they been doing for eight years? It not is. improving? No. Yeah. Apparently <laughs> not. Apparently couldn't afford to. No, they could afford to do it. They just don't want to do it. They're waiting for sweet and pop they, of Microsoft to buy them out. And um, I guess they're going to be a special edition Skyrim for Game Pass now. So just another portion of Skyrim that's going to be made for the 20th time. What can you do anymore that's more special? And there was nothing you could have done before. It, was before. it, was, <laughs> it, it, it just irritates me that we still waiting this long and they ain't going to do anything with it until um, StarCraft comes out. And StarCraft is still like what people, there's, there's no, I don't think there's any official you know, announcement for that either. And so it's probably still a good year or two at least. And then it's probably still going to be another year or two after that for Elder Scrolls. So it's easily going to be a decade since we got an Elder Scrolls game. And Elder Scrolls Blades does not count because that sucked. It promised <laughs> us Oblivion on the iPhone or mobile. And I didn't get Oblivion on mobile. I didn't even download it. I made fun of Josh because like only certain people was getting all the beta access to it and I was one of them and Josh tried and tried and he never could get it <laughs> for the <laughs> longest time. <laughs> Another thing that Xbox will be releasing a streaming app soon that will be available for iOS. And they haven't necessarily named this app yet, but it is distinct from the xCloud app. Uh, they couldn't, it wasn't necessarily working with the app store for iOS because they wanted them to independently place every video game title on there that you would be able to stream to your phone. And mm -hmm. Microsoft said that would just be almost too impossible to mm -hmm. expect people to do that and all the memory that would take up. So this will be their solution for that for the iOS 
actually on um, at phones you couldn't do that at all apple literally probably just last week updated the app store policy where you can screw can screen um games but um but this one is like doing a little bit different this is more like you get a remote access to your xbox and you can play it that way so it basically like um, me getting remote access you know to my computer and just playing a game like that right so so that's what it, it's really doing opposed to me going to like you know a streaming service with um titles and then you know like netflix and then playing the game but uh, it'd be more like me somehow accessing my blu-ray on my phone and watching it wirelessly you know th that way i guess my brain's equating it to more like a switch type deal you have your console version then you have your on the go version yeah i mean that's what both the X Cloud was going to be and stuff, but um, but yeah, it's like the computer only like says remote access. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, I was really um, bummed out that Xbox couldn't do the X Cloud on there and because of Apple and policy. And then Apple they said Apple did update the policy where you can allow streaming, but as you said, it's like it's almost useless like it's just apple you know being you know the typical corporate crap where it's like oh well yeah you can what are you talking about you, you know like you can scream abs like not the way we really <laughs> wanted to scream abs and you know it's just uh, it's like they just have to upload a game one at a time like mm -hmm. no like I, I just didn't understand like apple's thing was like they concerned about um you know, they wanted to review each app each game you know to make sure that you know it meets the guidelines but the thing is for them to be on microsoft or xbox or game pass they had to go through the exact same pretty much exact same review process to be on game pass so it's not like you know it's just gonna be some random all party app that's just gonna be throwing streaming stuff to your phone if this is microsoft and you know microsoft getting better and better about you know being you know more you know user friendly more about security privacy and stuff and maybe they're just worried that uh, epic games is going to find their way on there through a back door and then uh, brings us to epic games versus apple which is the fortnite's removal from the app store after they tried to pretty much make a bluff like blew up in their face throw fit and accuse apple of being a monopoly even though technically google play was doing the same thing and epic games even addressed google in the same accusations they were making to apple saying that oh you guys both take 30 percent on our in-game purchases but then they directly attacked apple accusing them of being a monopoly they can't be a monopoly if there's another company that's also doing the same practice it's not a monopoly yeah. they're not telling epic hey if you sign on with us you can't go to any other store or we're not going to give you the same privileges we would anyone else and we're not going to allow you to access the same things or you can't even be on our site they didn't do that so yeah i i think epics is fighting a losing battle it, it they done it they shot himself in the foot to be honest and you know even if they was doing this like to you know android or google you know i would be backing up google it's probably even more with google considering that on um, android you can't do the side loading stuff but epic said oh well um when you do that google has it where it says like oh this is from a the all party side um wish the, to continue yeah do you wish you to continue or blah blah and like oh that kind of puts off people you know and then it makes it they don't want to download it from siloed it they claim to be for the gamers and the people and small developers and stuff but they just end it for themselves and want just as much money as what apple or google and all the other Disney, Amazon, all the other big companies out there. It almost um, reads to me like they started seeing a decline in gameplay and were grasping at straws to figure out why that was happening and thought, well, it must be because our in-game app purchases, and I'm not really sure if they were going to even make it cheaper. I mean, they alluded to the fact that they would, supposedly, get cheaper to buy from them directly, yeah. but they might have just wanted all the profit. Yeah, that's all they wanted. They just wanted all the profit because they complain to steam about the exact same thing they complain to apple like oh we want our app store on your app store how does that even make sense you know and but we want it for free mm -hmm. it's like that 
makes no sense at all. They bring mm. up discussions like Uber and Amazon and products that you buy in real life not being put to the same thing that Apple does, or I imagine Google, where if they're purchasing from those, they get their own redirected to their own page. But it's a little different with an actual product. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of see the point. Like, well, yeah, because Apple always saying like, oh, well, games get created just the same as everyone else, all the other app developers. And technically, that's not really true if the other app developers don't have to do the 30 percent but the thing is like it's all digital the games and stuff and you know at um 30 percent and stuff kind of goes back to hosting the solvents and stuff to be able to allow them to publish these but it costs doesn't really cost nowhere near as much as it would for a physical copy. Kind of wondering, which I haven't seen, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know if they actually have proof that Apple doesn't charge these other... Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook was all in that court thing. Yeah, Senate and, hearing. Yeah, that's where it came out. Okay, because yes. I was going to say that. Because that had, like, this whole Epic thing came out right after that. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, I think this was all like pre planned and like, oh, see, Apple is gonna look bad now. Let's do this. And so everyone will be on our side. And then, like, right after the court hearing thing, the whole um, app, um, not Apple, but um, Xbox Game Pass, you know, they was denied to be on the Apple App Store because of you know, that you can't scream games at that point. And I think Epic just thought that was the, you know, the right time to strike. Yeah, I am an Apple fanboy, but like I said, it, even if they was doing this to Google, which they are, not as bad. My whole thing is like, if you sell it on the Xbox store, 40%. If you sell it on the PlayStation store, 40%. If you sell it on Nintendo store, the e-store shop level, 40%. And I think Steam is the exact same thing, 30%, everything 30%, you know, and... I'm guessing they probably were just expecting to go after the person with the biggest bucks, you know, which would be well, Apple, collectively. Tim, Tim Sweeney, he, he, he said the reason why they're not going after, like, Xbox and PlayStation and stuff, and Nintendo is because they marked down consoles and, and just pay it through the games that they sell, and so where Apple charge a premium for iPhones and, and for all the products and but, um the only thing is like kind of like um Tim Cook said a couple of years back that um an iPhone is everything it's your computer it's your um calculator so alarm clock it's your mp3 player it's your um camera and it's everything you know it's your voice record on whatever and, um it's like it's like 20 devices all built into one and all of that those ones are you know even if you don't like apple or not they all have really good the features and so i mean okay that's why i had to pay a premium price because i'm like these the cameras on the iphone or on, on a samsung galaxy are just about as good any professional camera out there it's uh also exposure because not everyone's going to have a game console but everyone has a cell phone mm -hmm. now whether or not they're actually gaming on their cell phones but chances are if they see candy crush and then they see fortnite they might click on and install it i don't it's just that chance like um my understanding is like um and i don't have anything official but my understanding that fortnite biggest where they sold the most or was making the most money was on mobile and they lost I, I hope that they lost millions now that people can't play it on there because they, you know, got themselves kicked off of the, these um, app stores and, and now they begging, begging the courts to force Apple to um, get, allow them to put Fortnite back on there. But they voided yeah. their contract. That's just not mm -hmm. how life works. Yeah, and if you went to the app store on, on iOS and look and like, oh, like best game to play on iPhone, Fortnite, best console level games fortnite um best game to play with friends fortnite actually just checked yeah. google too because they aren't arcing as much about google but it's not available on the play store as well no they they yeah. got shut they yeah. got shut down for the exact same reason just like you said it can't be a monopoly when apple has a policy and google has the exact same policy and i'm sure if you did it to the xbox store 
probably be the exact same thing. Yep. It's yeah. uh you would have to come up with a massive conspiracy and say that they were all in bed together and that they all sat down and said, Okay, well this is gonna be my policy on this apple, what do you think? And then Apple would have to agree or disagree. You would have to claim that they were all pretty much working in cahoots. Mm hmm. And full hat time. But yeah, uh, one thing funny, um I show you I, I sent you a link to it. Um right after they are a lawsuit against Apple, they put out parody of the nineteen eighty four Apple commercial for the Macintosh. Yeah. And that, that was pretty funny and you know, and just another thing to prove that they this was all pre meditated because it was all animation well i went to school for animation and can tell you that it's gonna take them a little bit to do that it wasn't like they did it overnight you know? yeah they were using models of fortnite characters too as well yeah. correct everyone yeah. sitting in the audience so it wasn't like you just had a bunch of shadow figures sitting there with a giant apple on yeah. television which that apple looked very familiar to with the sunglasses like it seemed like some kind of caricature for a cereal or something um, you could get in trouble for that kind of stuff too one thing was funny about that um um, Ripley Scott, who was the director of that, and he's also the director of like um, Blade Runner on Alien. Yeah. But he directed in 1984, and like, <laughs> he completely missed what Epic. Like, I I don't think he even know what Fortnite is, or maybe okay. he probably doesn't even know what iPhone is or anything. And like, he's like, oh well, that was kind of cool, but what they should have done is um talk about the uh desecration of democracy and society and it's like well, dude this is about a video game man this is not some about revolution <laughs> what is, is it because i'm guessing like, that that original apple commercial is probably off that books in the movie what was it 1984 1974 yeah 1984 yeah movie yeah. so he's probably just like yeah I didn't get the movie right at all or the book for that matter <laughs> it's like it, that apple kind of looked like donald trump but it didn't quite get the toupee right <laughs> and he was it was just funny because like dude do you know what what like, like i said do you even know what fortnite is <laughs> but um yeah and i thought that was pretty hilarious and um yeah it's it'll be interesting to see what happens to epic games as a whole now after this because yeah. apple's going to i think return counter sue for damages done probably yeah. to the reputation and for avoiding the contract that they assigned if apple's going to as well they could probably also expect google to follow suit yeah probably yeah, um one thing like i think apple is wrong about is actually epic games have two accounts on apple app store and i got the epic games which has got all the games like fortnite but i also got the epic games international um, account which is for all the game development stuff and like unreal engine which is used by other game developers to create games you know and when apple like is when you board the um contract they um shut down your account they like, nature account and they was gonna nominate epic games international account as well no actually the court told them like oh well actually that's a separate account and, and so you cannot do that and which was gonna be a really dumb thing apple would have done because like i said it being used by other game developers to create the games that is on the app store and so i think Apple got way too zealous to um to terminate that. I heard some people like oh to be epic fall because they put all those other developers in danger because they would have lost on game engine stuff. But I'm like well like I said, Apple just went overboard with it. And like the court said, that was a separate app. I can see where Apple's coming from a little bit. They're probably trying to get real preemptive and think of ways that Epic Games could try to, even though that international has nothing to do with their games, actually, it's just like you said, software to develop games. They're probably worried about them trying to sneak Fortnite into that. But if they did, then they just shut it down. Yeah. They're probably just trying to be too preemptive about it, which is also probably what they're going about with Xbox, with wanting to review every single game before it was actually put on their store, is they're going, well, we don't want to wait for something like Fortnite to sneak in when they've already voided the contract. Yeah. But I'm glad yeah. that they're waiting. Like you said, that would have been just a way to demonize Apple themselves if they had 
shut yeah. it down. Yeah, it would have been bad for iPhone, for them image and stuff. So I don't but, know why they even like thought about that. Like, and, like I guess it had it would. I guess they were just so pissed off and like, you know what? We're gonna shut the whole damn thing down. You know, yeah. you, know and, but, you and every single one you own. Mm-hmm. I think there's like even though I'm on Apple's side for the most part, except for the um Epic Game International and the um Xbox Game Pass thing, I do think that, you know, the app store policy does need another look at, you know, at least some things to be changed here and there. Um I don't know a hundred percent about this, but like my understanding is that all um, app developers has to pay a hundred dollars a year to Apple to be a developer for the App Store. And to me, like if you are an indie um, game on you know game developer, it's probably a lot of money to be paying. You already spend all your money trying to build a game. Now you can't publish to the App Store because you ain't got that hundred dollars, you know. And then you only you know you had to give thirty percent. Of the profits to Apple, and I just feel like you know there should be different levels of that. You know, like there should be a free version account where it's free and you just get the bare basic stuff, and maybe like a fifty dollars one where you get some of the stuff that you you get as a um app developer because you do get you know, software stuff and to help create your games and optimize it for the App Store. And then you can get the hundred dollars one if you have the money to do it. But but yeah, because I'm not sure if any of the other like Google Play or anything. I don't know if they charge a hundred dollars a year or two um, do that. And I think that's I always remember a lot of developers saying that Android was bad on because it was cheap on. I encourage you to look it up. Everything is thirty percent. So I'm not sure unless that was like this happened recently and i i always wanted to make my own yeah. app and a like, drawing app because i'm a comic book artist and graphic designer and it'd be cool to have it on the app store but as right now i probably couldn't get the hundred dollars and what yeah. this little expert did say is that the app store fees for android apps developers fees this is coming from tech republic sounds funny anyway Tech Republic. Uh, Android apps developer fees can range from free up to matching the Apple App Store fee of ninety nine dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Google Pay has a one. Google Play has a one time fee of twenty five dollars a year. Yeah. See, what was the false one? The- from free all the way up to matching Apple App Store fee of ninety nine dollars a year. But what App Store was that? This is a good question. Do you say that the Google Play is twenty five? Yeah, one time fee of twenty five. Well, that's interesting. You guys should definitely, especially if you're an app store developer or app store developer, if you're planning on developing an app to throw it to an app store. There's some interesting articles that Tech Republic was interesting as far as how payouts work. Um, most large app stores have that thirty percent threshold. They said that Apple wasn't the first person to set it, but that's definitely how it became famous. So Apple and Google both share that. And how often they pay you out? They said Google was one of the best with paying out within days of the end of the month and also there was no minimum you had to reach to get that payout. So, and they said some places, Slide ME was an app store they referenced that paid their developers 90% of purchases. So, Slide F-E? ME? M-E? I've never heard of that. So I guess it depends. <laughs> depends on where you're at and what apps you're looking at. And I guess that's what they're saying is that the smaller a app store is the more likely they'll pay you out a higher dividend but the less traffic you get so like they pointed out apple and google you're paying 30 percent but they're also giving you all this advertising mm-hmm. which let me tell you advertising is not cheap no. i know a man who's made a wonderful gun cleaner he, he was a gentleman who worked in had a background in chemical engineering and came up with a wonderful product that only cost twenty thousand dollars for him to make and pre- package but advertise it to actually sell he had to come up with two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars yeah, so. that's why i always want to get paid more for the design work there at, at the old job <laughs> anywhere else you to, they charge way more yep anywhere else so we're still too expensive mm-hmm. as i say Wait, it's just a too too small of a town and nothing but old people who don't know that stuff costs a lot I don't even realize that we're not the newspaper mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess that's uh, it for 
podcast. I can yeah. guarantee you next time I'll be raving about Yashihime. I hope. Yep. So, so long. Farewell. Stay safe. And fuck film clip critics and Netflix and Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.